but I wanted to in introduce my, uh, my president, uh, Chet Hewitt, to kick us off. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> yeah, let me, uh, I'm going to add my thank you uh, to that of Robert as well. I also want to thank you, because no one asked me what happened to my leg, why my foot's in this cast, uh, this boot today, uh, as well. It's a very exciting story, but I'll, I'll spare that for you. <laughs> At least my kids think so. <laughs> uh, but no, I really want to uh, thank all of you in this room and uh, some folks and acknowledge some folks who are not in this room who have really been an important part of this effort you know, going forward. There's been a lot of conversations about both the market analysis and the strategic plan, which we are formally releasing uh, here today. You all know there's been a lot of input into the development of these particular products. Uh, we've talked with community and community residents. We've talked with the large providers. There's been a lot of kind of clinic uh, involvement uh, as well. Uh, health plans. I mean, a real cross-section of the healthcare delivery system uh, here in this particular region including folks who are not engaged in delivery of clinical care itself. So a broader conversation about what it really takes to promote health and well-being uh, that has its roots in clinical care, but is clearly you know, about other things uh, as well. So I want to thank you. I also want to thank some of the folks who have been our funding partners in this, the California Endowment. I think Kristen Tien is here as well. Kristen, Kristen are you here? I'm here. Uh, yeah, thank you for your help and support. Uh, the Sacramento Region Community Foundation, I think Priscilla is here. Thank you, co funders of these studies. We want to acknowledge our partners in doing this particular work. Philly the Health Systems and the Community Health uh, Panelists who are going to be presenting here today. We're looking forward to that particular conversation. Uh, we also have uh, a, a Congressman Matsui who's going to speak in a, in a few moments, who's, who uh, has done yeoman's work on this. I'll say a little bit more about that, but I do want to acknowledge her contributions and leadership uh, in this particular work um, as well. Clearly our consultants, the folks at the Abaris Group, Barrett Hatches, uh, Public Health Institute, extraordinary work, uh, and a willingness to work in a team that I think is somewhat unusual for what we've actually done. Uh, and they're represented here by a number of folks, uh, I think you'll hear from Car Carmen uh, later on today as well, but uh, I want to say personally thank you and from the Sierra Health Foundation I uh, thank you to your organization for the extraordinary contributions you each have made to this particular effort uh, going forward. And then there's some of our thought partners uh, who may be here as well. Now, one of the things that we don't, we don't do in this business, we try not to do here at Sierra Health, is kind of go at the work alone. And so there's been a lot of consultation with the folks at the California uh, Healthcare Foundation, uh, with the Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation, who has also been contributing to this. The kind of intellectual kind of contribution doesn't show up you know, on a balance sheet uh, or a grant application, uh, but whose experience, whose ideas, and whose recommendations have also helped shape uh, this work uh, going forward. And then clearly um, to the Sierra Health Foundation board, who has believed in this work, uh, to, to, they've been able to allow us to fund it, um, and to the staff, who has really worked diligently uh, to carry it out. Uh, they, too, all offered, I think, um, an acknowledgment uh, for their contributions uh, that got us to this point that we are today. Let me end up, uh, at least in my initial opening remarks by um, welcoming to the podium uh, Congresswoman Doris Matsui. And for those of you who know the Congresswoman, uh, you know that she is incredibly committed uh, to health and well-being. As a member of the Commerce and Energy Commission uh, Committee uh, in the Congress, uh, you know, she fought hard for the Public Health and Prevention Fund, which is doing great work here as a site in uh, Sacramento, but in 61 communities across the country, uh, helping uh, promote health and well-being and better manage chronic diseases and illness uh, in a number of communities where that uh, is critically important to them as well. But I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the fact that we really got started down this path uh, at her insistence and urgence. Um, and you know that when she insists and urge, uh, you listen and do, right? <laughs> That's kind of how it works with the congressman. Um, and she was right on point, uh, as uh, is uh, the case often, if not always, as it relates to health as well. 
And she came to us a little bit over a year ago. She says, Chad, I've been doing this work. I've been convening people. We need somebody locally to do some of this work. And we talked about how that could happen, how we could work in partnership uh, to move this particular effort forward. And she has done everything and more that could have been expected of a partner. Now, this is not a partnership between Sierra Health and a congresswoman's office. It's between all of us. Right? We all care about health in this particular region. Right? We're all committed to making the things that need to happen or happen, to do it in a way that allows the folks who will be coming into care, but even the folks who have courage but who have been struggling to get care, really have the opportunity to get the kind of high quality care that they deserve. And these are, this, is, this is one of those issues that I think, you know, in the future, will really define what a great community really means, right? How giving it, it can possibly be and how it treats those who are in less fortunate circumstances than many of us in this particular room. I can tell you when I, when I, when I damaged my foot and ankle, it was great to know that my primary concern wasn't what the cost of this was going to be, right? Just I get to my doc soon enough, given the pain I was in. <laughs> Uh, to get the kind of care that I actually uh, uh, needed. Uh, so every once in a while you get a reminder about the real depth of importance uh, of the work that we're engaged in. And so with that, let me bring um, this particular effort champion uh, to the podium, Congresswoman Doris Matsui. vertical help here, you understand, but uh, thank you, Chet, for that very kind and generous introduction, and you all know Chet, uh, I thank you for your leadership and your passion. Um, you are a wonderful partner, and uh, we sort of fed off of each other in a sense. When we got together, we had all these ideas going crazy, and, uh, but it was it's absolutely wonderful, and it's wonderful to be able to talk to somebody who understands how important it is, who loves the community and sees the possibilities. And I think we here in this room have seen the possibilities in many, many years. And we really want to ensure that at this moment in time, when we have this Affordable Care Act, let's leverage it. Let's use it in a way that will benefit all of us here in Sacramento. And that's really what it's all about. So I'm so delighted to be here. And I also want to thank all the partners we've had here, all the consultants and the foundations and all the health plans, everyone who has been involved in this. And there have been many, many people. Chet and I are not people who keep things close to us. We like to spread it around. Because we really believe that there's so many ideas out there so many people who really understand what is going on. Uh, so many people who are experts and understand uh, and have gone through some of these exercises before. And we wanted to ensure that this is not just going to be another study, another analysis, another plan. The only way we were going to do this if we were going to do something with it. And that is what this is all about. Because we have spent the last year, in essence, talking with people, listening to experts, listening to all of you, uh, and even the people we talk with or listen to are even outside of Sacramento because we really wanted to get the very best ideas. That was our opportunity, particularly with Chet's help and the rest of you. So I want to thank everyone for participating in, in this effort because it took all of you to do this. I want to thank the clinics, the hospitals, the advocates who really participated in in-depth interviews. Now, this wasn't just a short little you know, test of checking off things at all. It really was just trying to dig deeply into what has happened. What, what, is, what are the possibilities here? What could make things better? Because that's what we're all about here. So it's really exciting to be here. I am so delighted to be here. We've been looking at this day for a really long time. And um, Chet mentioned that um, sometimes uh, I would get a little bit anxious and a little bit, when are we going to do this? When are we going to do this? It's a fine balance that Chet and I have because he said, wait a minute now, we've got to make sure that we've uh, talked to everybody and we have communicated everything we need to be doing. 
And that's the beauty of our partnership and the partnership with all of you. You know, we have many challenges in Sacramento. We love this place. But we all know that even in places that we love to live and work in, there are many challenges. We have a fragmented safety net. We all know that. And we know about budget cuts at every level of government. And the implementation of the Affordable Care Act will put thousands of residents, more residents, into insurance coverage. And the question is, how do we care for those in need? That's a very important question. You came together, all of you, with the Sierra Health Foundation to answer this very question and find much needed solutions. And really, tremendous work has gone into this and in developing an understanding of the challenges that we all have and the challenges moving forward also as we plan for the implementation of health care reform. In Congress, I always brag about um, the strong health care systems we have here and the clinics in our region. And this work is truly a testament to your dedication to serving all those in need. But with leadership, all of your leaders, comes responsibility. A responsibility to care for the neediest amongst us. Last year, last October, in fact, I stood before you asking for your participation and input into this process. Not a simple thing at all knowing full well the time commitment that it would entail. And as usual, you did not disappoint. The data collected for the market analysis identifies the best practices in this region and some very real obstacles that we will need to overcome. And most importantly, this data will help position us, our region, for the opportunities and challenges the full implementation of the Affordable Care Act will bring. The Affordable Care Act, at its very core, represents an unprecedented opportunity to make substantial improvements to our health care system and ultimately improve the health status of all Americans. And the intent of the law is to expand health insurance coverage to those who are not currently covered while reforming the delivery system to improve quality and access to care, all while driving costs down over time. But in order to be successful, we need thoughtful, and I say thoughtful, collaboration and commitment from all stakeholders. We have less than 18 months to go before full implementation of the law in 2014. That's not that long a time at all. So there is really a sense of urgency driving our actions. The challenges facing our region are vast. We must seek to strengthen a safety net that will need to support over a quarter million more adults and children who are poised to receive health coverage through expanded Medi-Cal benefits beginning in January 2014. We know that if we fail to prepare for and implement health care reform, our region will miss out on significant investment opportunities to improve our health care delivery system. But most importantly, if we fail to prepare, we'll be letting the public down, the very people that this law was passed to help. We have a moral responsibility to do the very, very best for our community. This is not a risk we can take, and thanks to the great work of this partnership, we're on the right track. The collection of data and critical planning was just the first step. Now the true work begins. It's implementation. We'll be hearing exciting news today about commitments that have already been made and plans that are moving forward to strengthen our region. You will also be contacted in the days and weeks ahead to come about moving forward to make the strategic plan a reality. We all know this will require more meetings. Listen, I know about meetings. We have to have a point to the meetings. So we'll not have meetings unless we absolutely need them. But we will need more meetings coming together. This is an exciting time, and we must take advantage of the progress that has already been made 
and build upon this momentum. What is clear? What is clear is that to succeed in these goals and improve our healthcare system in the region, we have to work together and we must succeed. I encourage everyone here to talk about what we're doing. Educate your colleagues, the local policy makers, community organizations, patients and local residents to ensure they understand and recognize the barriers and opportunities that our healthcare system faces and what we're trying to accomplish. After all, they have the biggest stake in this process. Sierra Health Foundation staff who've been working closely on all these reports are happy to help you communicate the data in the best possible way to ensure commitments move forward. And the strategic plan presents a number of opportunities to strengthen capacity and collaboration, especially for our community health clinics. This plan encourages clinics to think big about ways you would like to expand. There will be more about this opportunity discussed later today. Ultimately, I believe we have the opportunity to create a safety net that lowers costs and provides the highest quality of care to Sacramento residents and that can serve as a model to communities across this country. This is a goal I know that we all strive for and success will depend on having everyone on board. You're all doing great things here. We just need to make sure that we're sharing opportunities and finding areas to work together. I promise, listen to me, I promise to continue working with you, all of you, to ensure that Sacramento region sees full realization of all the benefits provided by the Affordable Care Act, positioning our region for success. This is a central element of why I'm a member of Congress. I think all of you understand health care impacts everyone. Everyone. And every single one of us have had some sort of personal experience with health care. We know it can be better. We are grateful for what we have, but we also see the possibilities. This is a wonderful opportunity to make it happen. So I thank you very much for going on this journey this far. We have 18 more months to complete it, to ensure that we have the best system and collaboration in place. And I believe that we are going to do it. So thank you very much for everything you're doing. I certainly appreciate everything that you've done so far and what we'll be doing together uh, moving forward. Thank you. You know, you, you all have copies of uh, the reports in your uh, folders in front of you. Uh, I think it's uh, worth uh, giving a special acknowledgement to our communications department, uh, Susan King and Katie Pacini, who've done a lot of work uh, to not only give you a, a visually attractive document, but that's loaded with really good information um, about the work that we've actually done over the past uh, year. Now, you know, when we started this a year ago, we said we were going to conduct this analysis. We were going to build a plan that we all could get behind to do some of the work. Uh, and that was really um, the breadth of our commitment at that particular point uh, in time. But uh, at our annual retreat, which took place uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we had a long conversation uh, with our board of directors, two of the members are actually here with us today, Dr. Claire Palmer and uh, Ms. Nancy Lee. Uh, and we talked about where we were. Uh, we talked about the importance of the work, um, about being a little behind many other communities as it relates to being prepared. The risk of not you know, trying to invest in ways that perhaps could allow us or would allow us to cover more ground in what's really a relatively short period of time. Uh, and the risk associated with doing that. Uh, because it is a lot of a ground to cover and one could make uh, an argument that perhaps a little bit too late um, 
uh, as well. Uh, but our board um, uh, didn't see it that way. I think that staff prepared a, um, a, a great presentation that really laid out the arguments uh, and the board agreed. So uh, today we're prepared to announce that the foundation will spend $3 million over the next 36 months uh, working with all of you uh, in three critical areas. The first is in working to build the capacity of our community health clinics, those providers, so they are as prepared as possible for the implementation of health care reform. Now this is both the human capital side uh, as well as the infrastructure side uh, where we know folks are struggling. This is not a unique struggle to this community. So this is not in some way some admission that somehow we are uh, uh, you know, unable or unwilling to do this particular work. I think the analysis and the plan kind of highlighted some things that we need to invest in. The second thing we're going to be investing in is really trying to help uh, the elected officials and other kind of political bodies uh, understand what a healthy public policy environment that would work in support of this endeavor could look like. What are some of the options and choices that need to be made? Because our, our policy environment poses some very unique challenges for Sacramento in particular in terms of our ability uh, to move forward. Um, the third area will really be around public education and community engagement. Because if there's one thing that we've come to, I think, appreciate more than ever before in the world of health, is that what people know, how they think, and how they behave has an impact on their health, both their ability to access care when they actually need it, and also to make healthy choices about what they consume, whether they exercise, and the environments that they're actually in uh, as well. Now, we don't have a detailed plan to do that, uh, although Diane will be saying more about how we plan to move forward. Uh, and we don't have a detailed plan, not because we haven't thought a lot about this, but we're going to remain committed to our initial agreement, and that is to work collectively and collaboratively with all of you to help flush some of those ideas out. Right? Otherwise, it would be a new game. So we like to consider this the conclusion of what I will call phase one, and today is the official launch of phase two, which is to make the promise of both of those reports real. And so with that, thank you. With that, I'll turn it over to the person whose responsibility it will be to make that happen, Mr. <laughs> Robert Cook. Let, let me just say, he's more than up to the task. So thank you, Chet. So, you know, context is always important when we have these conversations, and uh, this is no different. Um, so one of the things we'd like to do to put um, what the Congresswoman and Chet have just discussed in context is what we actually found. Um, so we've talked about this, this market analysis. We've talked about this strategic plan. So we want to encapsulate that for you. Um, so I want to kick that off, and I'm going to ask uh, my man Abraham uh, to come up. Um, and what we're going to do in this part of the agenda is myself, um, Abraham Daniels, who I'm going to introduce in a second, and Dr. Carmen Navarez, um, who I'll also introduce, are really going to talk about this. But I wanted to just start here first, because, you know, I believe that sometimes it's better to just show you than to tell you what we're talking about. Um, and this is really what we're talking about here today. So, you know, I was looking for something visually that would help us just kind of encapsulate the conversation and came across this in the paper a couple weeks ago and this just felt appropriate. Uh, because this is um, what you'll hear in a moment, um, but it really is, we have a coming wave of folks. And the wave isn't just in bodies. The wave is also an attitude right, and the way people will, will seek care and what we have to do to respond to it. 
Um, so Abraham Daniels, who's going to come up next, is our program officer um, for this healthcare partnership. But most importantly for us, though, he also is, he's been the leader of this. Uh, it has been Yeoman's work to kind of keep this pushing, and Abe with both hands has held this together in spite of a lot of things that have uh, tried to pull his hands apart. Um, so A will come up and talk about the data, and then Dr. Carmen Navarez, who's also is part of the PHI team, been a part of this work with us, who, again, I won't go into her bio, but I'll just say that Carmen has been a real leader in the field uh, around a lot of this work, and particularly around the intersection of how do we merge this health conversation with this primary care conversation, um, and has done this both as president of um, American uh, Public Health Association has done this from her perch at PHI, but has also done this as a practicing physician and a public health practitioner. And then I'll wrap it up with uh, what we actually found and what are we going to do about it. Um, and then we'll talk about next steps. So, hey. Thanks, Robert, and good afternoon, everyone. As you've heard, we've leveraged our partnerships today. Uh, the Sacramento Region Community Foundation and the California Endowment to really complete phase one. And last year, our journey began by preparing the Sacramento Region Safety Net and preparing for health reform implementation in 2014. And you've heard from Chet, we partnered with an amazing team of consultants. The Barris Group was our project lead. Mike Williams is knowledgeable about data collection all up and down the state of California. And he's, been, he's done some familiar work here in Sacramento County. The Public Health Institute, they bring in uh, GIS mapping, the provider perspective, and more importantly, knowledge about the Affordable Care Act. And our third firm, Dr. Barrett Hatches, with Hatches Consulting, who will moderate our panel this afternoon, is knowledgeable about federal qualified health centers and the primary care safety net. This work really helped us understand a deeper understanding of the current and forecasted capacity of the primary care safety net, as well as engage the community in developing a regional strategic plan. Today, we celebrate the work that you all provided in terms of this market analysis. It's been a lot of hard work, but this data helps drive the conversation going forward. Currently, in the Sacramento region, Consumers that have Medi-Cal have trouble finding a primary medical doctor that will accept Medi-Cal. That in, impacts health outcomes, access, but we know that we have one resource in the community. Community health centers accept Medi-Cal patients. But if we have current problems, by 2014, the impact of the Affordable Care Act in the Sacramento region means that 227,000 500 non-elderly adults and children will now be eligible for Medi-Cal or private subsidized insurance. Of that, 52% will be eligible for Medi-Cal, a key payer source for federally qualified health centers because of the higher reimbursement rates due to their federal designation. All of these consumers will be entering our current fragmented healthcare delivery system. But it's important to find out where these consumers live. As we've learned in our work with the CTG, that place matters when it comes to impacting health outcomes. And in 2009, the percentage of uninsured by zip code was as high as 19% in certain areas of the, uh, within this region. That impacts uh, quality of life and health outcomes for within these communities. By 2014, when health reform goes into effect, we see that there's a significant decrease in the percentage of uninsured to less than 5%. Still remaining is uh, undocumented and working poor. That issue will need to still be addressed. But there's a sense of urgency to build the capacity of the primary care safety net because there's a projected increase of 44% in utilization of community health centers from now to 2016. 
And when we look at the trend of utilization per population size, we see that the Sacramento region, indicated in the red, had considerably lower utilization rates when compared to the state average, as well as other communities in the state of California. A deeper analysis of the number of community health centers per population size highlights that the Sacramento region, down here at the bottom, had the fewest number of community health centers, including fewer federally qualified health centers when we look at the rest of the state. This is a missed opportunity in terms of accessing federal resources, and more importantly, the quality of care. We know that federally qualified health centers provide medical, dental, and behavioral health services at a lower cost and a, and a good quality of services. Along with looking at infrastructure, we must take a look at workforce capacity. And we see that the current utilization per provider will be higher, will increase by 2016, far exceeding our current capacity. And that capacity will impact the quality of outcomes, patient wait times, and what we're going to need to do to resolve the capacity issues by 2014 is add 13 full-time equivalents. That's 13 additional providers just to meet the expanded growth with healthcare reform, and by 2016, a total of 13 providers. One consequence of having a lack of workforce capacity is that consumers go to the emergency department to seek out general care. These are preventative services that could have been provided at low cost within a primary care setting. 46% of those consumers had Medi-Cal, again a key revenue source for federally qualified health centers, and a lot of these visits could have been avoidable and preventable. Common cough and cold, uh, but a lot of these consumers, it comes down to the convenience. Emergency departments are open 24-7, as well as uh, quality of services. And when we take a look at the projected capacity of emergency departments, we see that there's a 38% projection in utilization rates. This far exceeds the national standards as well as our current capacity within the Sacramento region. The emergency departments are our default safety net. And this is not an adequate solution to fixing the problems of the primary care safety net. A, con a consequence of not capturing the consumers that go to the emergency departments can be seen in these financial statements for the community health centers. In 2010, there is an exceeded uh, loss in revenues by 10.6, but more importantly, 43% of these community health centers report an average loss of 1.2 million. That impacts the number of services and programs provided, as well as workforce capacity. Another deeper analysis between 2006 and 2010 is that these losses exceeded revenues. And as community health centers continue to grow to meet the capacity needs, they're not able to maintain operations given uh, financial constraints. Making sure that the right payer mix comes through their doors is important. But providing all this data helps us get a deeper understanding of our current capacity. But I'd also like to bring in uh, Dr. Carmen Navarez to give us a different perspective and an interpretation of the, the facts that were just presented. Thank you. Um, I'm sure how different my perspective may be. It might be just a little bit more um, uh, nuanced in a slightly different way. Um, let me say this. First of all, there is some good news here. The data don't lie. They tell, they tell a very challenging story. 
but there are a few good points here that are worth that are really worth uh, underscoring. First of all, there is some excess capacity in the system. Um, one of the things that we did in the market analysis was we went and we talked to physicians. And it was felt amongst those physicians that there were more folks out there that wanted to be a part of a system that would address the safety net need. So there are some physicians, they're out there that like to be involved and we need to have a system that accommodates them and that they can find and that patients can find. The second is geographic managed care still has some capacity that can be built out. And the third is that even though this area's community health centers are relatively young compared to other parts of the state, that means they have room to grow. That means they can really benefit from the kinds of uh, expertise that's found in the rest of the state, that's found in this community. And that's part of why I'm really glad, Chet, that you said that technical assistance is going to be in this next round of funding because this is going to be an area that really is going to is, is going to need that kind of expertise. Other places have done somewhat better, but they've also got older clinic networks and they've had experiences and they've made mistakes and they've learned from them and those learnings can be brought into this community and help to fortify what you already have. The next thing is that there's going to be more people that are insured by Medi-Cal. And if you're a private provider, that probably doesn't sound like great news to you. But if you're in a community clinic, that's music to your ears. I've been the medical director at two community clinics, one that was a storefront in the San Diego area and one that was a federally qualified health center, rather large one in the Bay Area. And in both places, having a patient walk in the door with Medi-Cal was great because it meant that they weren't doing sliding fee scale and paying maybe five or $10 for their care. So Medi-Cal may not provide enough for a private practice setting, but it does work in a community clinic setting. And the third thing is location, location, location. In the Sacramento region, the community health centers are located in the areas of greatest need. And that's really important because you don't have to go do bricks and mortar in a lot of new locations. They're already there. They may be new, they may be, there may be some new ones, there may be, they may be young, but they are there and that's important. Then there's some bad news. There's a lot of bad news in what was said. The remaining uninsured, that's 75,000 people. Working poor, people who don't qualify, people who are not yet holding papers in their hands. Those are the people that make the services that you all take part in every day. They make them work. There's a responsibility to those people, but they're not going to have any coverage. And it's 75,000 people, not a few. Another is that um, some of the people who are going to be, many of the people who will be coming into care coverage for the first time in decades are people that for decades have ignored their minor problems. They have become more than minor problems. They are now major problems, unaddressed hypertension, unaddressed screenings that they should have had, and now there are things that are going to require interventions. We haven't had a system to provide the kind of preventive screenings for those folks that really do pay off in other communities. That's an important element, and they are going to come, 225,000 of them are going to start coming to the doors. Um, and I want you to go back for a moment in your, in your mind to the emergency department use slide for just a second. Now, 46% of the Medi-Cal users, 46% of the Medi-Cal users uh, emergency department use was not emergency, but 40% across the board was non-emergency. So it doesn't matter who your payer source is here in this community. People don't know how to find primary care. So it's not just a poor people's problem. It's everybody's problem. And that's a problem of system. There's a problem, and, and, and again, I'm really glad that you're including the piece there for outreach and community education because this is where it can really matter. This is where an investment can really make, make a difference. It's, it is very bad news that 40% is non-emergent. That's very serious. That's unsustainable. And as the population grows, 
it's going to be something that brings everybody's access to good care down. So it needs to be addressed, and it's unfortunately bad news. And there's more bad news. So from the provider side, the outpatient capacity provided by the community health centers is insufficient. There aren't enough of them. They aren't seeing as many patients as are seen in other areas. Part of that is being new, learning the systems. And again, this is where the technical assistance will really matter. The fact that 50% of them are financially challenged is a serious problem. But it's an opportunity, even though it's on the bad news slide, I'm going to say it's an opportunity. And I think it's really an opportunity where some of the knowledge that can be leveraged for how to get them to understand how to quickly implement systems that will help make them more financially uh, stable. And then there's that issue of regional coordination. Well, I know that you'll be having lots of conversations about that, so I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail on that, but clearly you can't float this kind, a region this size without some kind of regional, regional coordination. Um, and it's not just size, it's complexity. This is a large, complex, richly endowed community, and it needs coordination that's got to be regional because it's not going to float. You've got less than two years to get this going, and you're going to need some strong hands in the steering here. So what did I think were some of the hidden opportunities? Well, there are limited systems in existence for cost-effective ma management, but there are some out there, and I think that we need to look at those examples and really build upon them and uh, amplify uh, you know, amplify how they work for others so that people can see and then start to implement ways to change their system. And I think part of that is going to be what you're doing here with community transformation. The system isn't just a system of care. It's a system that goes all the way back into how you live your life. And that's what you're doing with the community transformation grant. You're attempting as a community to find ways to prevent chronic disease before it starts. That has an end benefit, and that will be seen eventually in the care system. But you have to hit it from both sides at once. And I'm really, uh, I'm really pleased to see that you've undertaken that, um, uh, that uh, journey. The next thing is that there's a, there, there aren't enough, but there are some very key, critical, leveraged relationships here. And I'm hoping that the panel will bring into, uh, uh, bring into focus some of those leveraged relationships, because those are the leveraged relationships that really have to grow here. You've got a lot of stuff to work with, but the parts need to work with one another in order to work better and more efficiently. Insufficient outpatient capacity, we've already talked about that. Une uneven distribution of specialty capacity. I'm hoping that one of the speakers this afternoon is going to talk about what his vision is for what that could look like. There are a lot of ways that, a lot of ideas that are being discussed now for moving capacity for specialty care into remote communities. And we can think in many ways as those here who are unserved as being in a remote community. And we should be thinking about how to utilize the lessons from elsewhere and bring them into this community and try to figure out how we can make it work for us. So I don't need to tell you that the system here needs fixing. You already know that. <laughs> but let me finish on a, on a uh, mixed up note. <laughs> so I'm, I've spent some time here. I, I went to high school here. I'm, I'm a St. Francis girl. And, uh, and then I came back. And I studied family practice at UC Medical Center for a while. Spent a nice hot summer doing that. And then I came back after that and practiced and also worked with the Department of Health Services doing a public health residency, learning the ins and outs of public health before I moved to my home, which is in Oakland. I still spend a lot of time here. Um, so I know that this is a community with really rich educational resources. It's got 
a very dedicated and long-standing history of providers that are very, very fervent about the kind of work that they provide. This is a community of people who have a lot to give, and I recognize that. It may not be as organized, as connected, and as leveraged as it needs to be in two years, but you've got a lot of the raw material for getting this work done. So providers need to organize themselves into systems that are truly responsive to the fact that in two years, a quarter of a million people move in with coverage. And consumers are going to need to learn about where the systems are, how to get there from here, and how to use it well. The problem is urgent, the time is short, and failure is not an option. Thank you. Uh, so thank you both. So I um, want to just uh, draw out some of the key observations that we had at the end of this, but also talk about how those observations lead into what uh, this community decided uh, it wanted to do about this. Um, So we've heard both from Abe and Carmen either explicitly or implicitly um, four things. Uh, we heard pretty clearly that there's fragmentation, that there's fragility, and that financially we're on a path that really isn't going to allow us to move forward. That's something that we have to deal with. And um, some of that is driven by the fact that there isn't really a clear point of regional convergence around leadership that there isn't a real kind of hand on the tiller around how we actually deal with these questions. Um, that we have capacity here. Uh, that's not the question, but um, that capacity is challenged. And not just in the primary care safety net, but also in the other strategy that we have defaulted to to provide primary care, which is in the emergency departments as well. We have some capacity issues. And that, that capacity is at real risk of being overwhelmed, not just by ACA, but just by regular market forces in terms of demand. That even if ACA went away tomorrow, that we still have some problems we have to address. Um, but the great news is that there's acknowledgement that, yeah, all this exists, and we want to do something about it, right? And that there's a willingness to kind of take this on. And there was a, a conversation that really led to uh, what do we do about that? That led to a, a real simple vision. Um, it's not a complicated one, but it's, uh, it is a big one. And you know, simplicity usually does lend itself to big things. To create a sustainable regional primary healthcare system that's collaborative, accessible, high quality, culturally competent, outcome based. Those are all the things that we hear in the world around what does it take to be kind of a high performing system. Well, this region on its own kind of came to that um, in its conversations. Um, and that was really driven by a number of things that actually are happening in the region. So there's a list of 10 um, that this community put on the table that is already, um, people are already engaging in, it's already active, that people already feel like they have some ability to do. But this community also decided that in order to get to that vision, we do have to focus. Because as Carmen said, you know, time is short and failure is not an option. And I think there was general agreement in the room uh, that that maxim is true, that we don't have a lot of time to be messing around, so what are we actually really going to do? Um, and so the actionable plan that it narrowed to was really around this notion of collaboration. As we heard, collaboration was a core theme uh, throughout our conversation that improving this connection between primary care and specialty care was something that folks really wanted to take on. So this is a hidden opportunity that Carmen talked about. How do we leverage what we already have that we know is very, very strong and connected to something that we know we need to build up? That care coordination was necessary, and it wasn't just care coordination between primary care and the hospital, it was care coordination, generally speaking. How do we make sure that we get the best outcomes possible for all folks that walk through our doors. And that we make sure that the front end of that, the primary care capacity, is up to the task of taking that on. That really is, in a nutshell, the actions that folks said that they wanted to take. Okay. So with that, 
I'd be remiss without saying um, a couple different things, and I'm, I'm going to let us break in a second because I know we've been sitting for a minute. But uh, one, if you're wondering why we're not taking questions, it's because we want to make sure that the agenda that we have and the conversations that are coming up get ample time. But I'm pretty certain that the individuals who are speaking um, after our program is done will be more than willing to take any question that you may have, and you probably get a better answer at a reception than you would if you asked them when they're on the panel. Um, Barrett uh, is going to kick us off on a conversation um, with some of our health leaders in the region around what actually is happening. What are we already doing? Um, and following that, we'll have a conversation with uh, Dr. Kaiser, or more a call to action from Dr. Kaiser, rather, less a conversation. Um, and I'll uh, introduce him later, but one thing we should note about Dr. Kaiser, if you haven't read his bio, that's important for this conversation, is the conversation we're engaged in is one that he's already kind of helped lead. Um, so he'll provide us some insights on that. And then we'll turn to Diane about more detail on what does it actually mean for our commitment in terms of the areas that CHEP scoped out. 